like veins, they snake through the city streets, across parks, through schools. 20 kilometres of suspicion and hatred, separated by bricks, metal and wire. But as well as providing protection for the rocks, bottles and pipe bombs, the so-called peace walls also offer opportunity, employment and a sense of purpose. China has its Great Wall, Berlin used to have one, now no visit here is complete without a tour of the mighty walls of Belfast. Conway Street and I remember this particular street in 1969 as a 16-year-old. I remember the gunfire coming from the Shankill which is only 50 metres ahead of us here. You can actually see the dividing peace wall and I just remember running, jumping into the houses to get down out onto the safety of the Falls Road at that particular time. Quite an experience. In his wildest dream, Seamus Kelly could not have foreseen that he would end up as a tour guide, explaining the troubles from a nationalist point of view and how he and so many of his friends ended up in prison after fighting for a united Ireland. It's emotional, um, but there's been much more things that have happened since then, um, between then and now, that much be much more emotional. Um, when, when I relate to the hate blocks and the hunger strikes and the comrades who I knew, spent time with, who actually died on hunger strike, that, that to me is very, very emotional. That's raw, that's like yesterday. Although it's 28 years ago, that's very, very raw. The tour takes in the murals and the memorials to the fallen and provides jobs for former IRA prisoners like Seamus Kelly. You wouldn't consider going through these gates yourself and doing the tour on the other side? It wouldn't be practical. I wouldn't be talking about a, 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 a coming from a unionist perspective. Um, so that's why ex loyalist ex-prisoners would do that. Just through these gates, it's loyalist territory, and time for a change of guide and side. 20 years ago, you'd have been trying to kill each other. That's correct, but right. times move on. There's a whole new political dispensation here in Ireland at the moment. Projects such as this help that understanding. Neither side has changed fundamental beliefs, but the days of assassinations and kneecappings appear to be over. The fact of fear of being killed, Without the fear of being blown up. Loyalist tour guide William Smith also spent time in prison during the Troubles. The transformation from war zone to tourist town was unimaginable a few years ago. I was in prison for attempted murder. But, I mean, that may sound, you know, uh, really, um, what would you call it, um, bizarre now at this particular time. But in that, in 1970, Thousands of young men went to prison. I, I will always say that that was a lost generation. At least some in that generation are now finding a new sense of purpose, explaining their side of the conflict to visitors. While we walk the wall, more tourists draw their conclusions on it. Here, the writing on the wall is almost exclusively from foreigners. I think it's kind of an odd thing. I, I think it would make more sense to see locals coming to sign the wall instead. So, and that would make it a peace wall, <laughs> for sure. It's an extraordinary transformation when tourism supplants terrorism. This is enormous progress, but while the visitors come and go, the walls remain, splitting two communities. It may seem strange that 10 years after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, although there was political progress and measurable, as chaotic as it may sometimes be, here at the interface where Catholic meets Protestant, these walls are still as they were because the people here see them not as dividing communities, but protecting them. And this is what can happen where there are no wars.
In the North Belfast area of Ardoin, there's been a tradition of violence handed down from one poisoned generation to another. It erupted again during the annual Orange Order marches. Hopes had been so high that this was over. And the day had begun so differently. Well, the 12th of July is a special occasion in the year. It's one of the most important days for me in the year. As you can see, it's a great carnival, a great festival. You've only to look at the parade itself and see there the artistry of the banners, the, the music of the bands, the colour of the occasion, the great crowds that are out. It's a family occasion. You have grandparents, parents, children. It's a day really that uh, could be enjoyed by anyone. You won't see many Catholics here. Most see this celebration of the Protestant victory at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 as offensive and a provocation. The majority stay away, but four years of relative peace came to a violent end this time. You can see things are getting very tense here. The marches are expected to come up through this area, a Catholic area, very soon. And this is just an expression of the sort of tension this day evokes. And at the moment, it's getting very rough. The Ardoin has long been a flashpoint. It's where Catholic and Protestant territories meet. No wall keeping them apart. No place either for an Orange Order march, according to these people. Everyone here is used to the rocks and even the petrol bombs. And in reply, the baton rounds and the water cannon. But for the first time since the 1970s, someone fired a gun here, a worrying new threat that had police on edge. Eventually, the Orange Order did pass, but the rocks and abuse rained down on them. Sinn Féin's Jerry Kelly was quickly on the scene, blaming the Orange Order for marching here, but also dissident Republican groups like the real IRA for organising the attacks. What's this say about the peace process? The peace process is solid. The political process is solid. Let us not exaggerate what happened here. These are small micro groups who incidentally came together when they thought they saw the opportunity uh, to bring down uh, the peace process in a single incident, in a single night. They will not uh, achieve that. They will feel, they have already feel they are a field entity. They have no strategy. They are going nowhere. It's very important not to distort what happened over the last couple of days uh, from the overall uh, picture which has, I think, been a very good news story worldwide for some uh, 15 years. It's an optimism not reinforced by recent events, a series of killings over the last few months. The first left two soldiers dead, shot at an army post. And two days later, the dissident continuity IRA was blamed for the murder of Constable Stephen Carroll the first policeman killed in a terrorist attack in Northern Ireland for 12 years. A few days later, another funeral, this time 49-year-old Catholic community worker Kevin McDay. He was beaten to death as he tried to help a friend being attacked by a mob. His wife was bashed too. Amongst the mourners was Deputy First Minister Martin McGuinness. We have to see all of this in a proper perspective. The big story out of the killings of the last number of weeks has been the way in which the political process has come together to repudiate the activities of the, those who would try to plunge us back into the past. You cannot compare under any circumstances the way things are today from where they were 15 or 20 years ago. We are in a fundamentally different and better place. It is true, despite the recent setbacks, it's still a long way from the bad days of open sectarian warfare. And ironically, the very structures that divide also secure.
in a perfect world, it would be great to see peace. But let's face it, it's Belfast, Northern <laughs> Ireland, and it's, no, it's never going to be peace here. Loyalist William Brown and his family have lived for years across the road from one of the walls. Talk of knocking them down is not seen here even as a faint possibility. No, definitely not. For everyone's sake, it's best just to keep the wall up, to keep a peace. Uh, if you pull that wall down, there will be murder, mayhem, there will be blood spilt. You can guarantee now yeah. there will be big, big trouble. So we're just coming on dark now. Is this about when the rioting would start when you were young? Yes. When they falls, when the rain falls, that's when we come out. William so Brown takes me the few hundred metres from his house to the same place where the political tours do their handovers. I don't trust anyone. I wouldn't trust anyone in my and life. the chances of peace? There's no peace here and there'll never be peace. But that's a pretty pessimistic view, isn't it? Well, I'm the one living on the peace line. I know. I've seen it. You always have your fractions. This place is like like a Palestinians and the Israelis. This is the same scenario. When were you playing it there? First part. Is that, what's that, the school team? Yeah. On the Republican side, Sean that. McVeigh cannot escape the shadow of the walls. He lives too close to forget this has been a war zone and his family and home attacked. How do you feel about this wall now? Would you like to see it down? Well, it's ugly, it's horrible, but at the moment, it's necessary, you know, it's, uh, in my mind, uh, walls aren't only physical, aren't only made of mortar or steel or wire, but there's also walls of prejudice and uh, there's walls that were built 300 years ago here and are still here in legislation and in prejudice and bigotry. So, those are the walls that are going to have to go down first. It's a sentiment echoed across this city. It's attitudes, not masonry, that need dismantling. The people would be on each side of the road and the police and military vehicles would And be Father Aidan Troy has learnt from bitter experience. I was terrified. I was terrified not for myself so much, but I was terrified some child was going to be killed or very badly injured. And with that, a, a live device, a bomb was thrown over. In that split second, it dawned on me, this is beyond anything that anyone could have imagined. Back in 2001, Father Troy found himself in the middle of one of the ugliest confrontations in recent years. As Protestants tried to stop Catholic children from walking through their area on their way to school. We were always very conscious that once we got through the gate, they moved without looking left or right, right into the school. Now that terrible period is over. But the conflict isn't over, is it? No, I think this is one of the one of the very sort of worrying aspects that I think I've learned so much from this. I think peace is 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 very much a gradual process, and I think there is genuinely a move forward, but there's always the danger of slipping back. There are no riots here. At Hazelwood Integrated Primary in North Belfast, Catholics and Protestants share the playground. I want you to perform the action and the classroom. What's he doing? He's singing. The main lesson here is if you educate people together, you can break the cycle of distrust. I've left a gap between... If it was a Catholic school, only Catholics could go there. And what do you think about that? Um, I don't know. Do you think that's a good idea or not? I don't think it is because it's good to let other people in your school. Do you think about if they're a Catholic or a Protestant or does no, it? it doesn't really matter. Despite the obvious success here, few of Northern Ireland's schools are integrated. And for Principal Jill Houston, it's been a frustrating struggle against entrenched opposition. Opposition from government, opposition from parents, opposition from churches, but a total belief that having children educated together is sensible. Not, it shouldn't be something that's different, it should be the total norm in any normal society. And yet there's only about 5% of 
yes. Northern Ireland children in schools like this? Yes, uh, basically, uh, I regret to say our politicians and uh, our senior civil servants and our people who have come over from English rule have not seen the value uh, and, and don't want to upset the local politicians, I, I think, by ensuring that most schools should be integrated. And yet for you it's a no-brainer? Total no-brainer. Integration is something happening in some unexpected places. In this Belfast commercial art gallery, two street mural artists are working side by side. That's new. But what's also unique is that they come from diametrically opposed backgrounds. I'm just recreating a picture of Bobby. It's a mural I did several, well, many years ago on the Falls Road. This is Danny Devaney's iconic mural of Bobby Sands, the IRA hunger striker who died in prison. Devaney's artistic talents are well known in Republican areas. He was in prison for attempting to rob a bank to raise money for the IRA. Now he shares a gallery with Mark Irvine, the son of a loyalist politician who was jailed for fighting the IRA. It's a level of collaboration unthinkable just a few years ago. But I think a wee bit of undercoating that, a wee bit of... And then just touch it, touch it up. Sort of. But in the main, it's still in good nick, like. Danny Devaney hasn't changed his political views. His work reflects a worldview of revolutionary struggle. But both he and Mark Irvine have bridged the religious and political divide. Their message that with goodwill, anyone can do it. We totally uh, are appalled by the issue of sectarianism, where young people are divi divided apart because of their religion. In fact, the irony is, me and Mark live about 100 yards from each other, me, and we've never met each other. Uh, his father would have been the same age as mine, and again, we probably, when we did meet, we got on very well together. We have so much in common. Do you worry it could descend back to the bad old days again? You've always got that worry, but I, I can't see sort of how that could happen. I think we've moved too far forward, and I think that the general populace don't want it. They just want to live a normal, peaceful life and get on with their lives. So I don't think anybody wants to go back to the way it was. Uh, have you had any luck convincing him about the unionist cause and, and vice versa? <laughs> no. <laughs> but we agree to disagree. Inside the glass and steel of a modern Belfast shopping mall, the dominant ideology is consumerism. It's part of a new world where old brands seem unnecessary. Catholic, Protestant, Loyalist or Republican. And in the city streets and many residential areas, people do live peacefully side by side. And yet it seems most in the city still see the removal of the walls a long way off. People still are fundamentally distrustful of each other. And I think that's why we have so many peace walls and quotes in Belfast. It's bridges we need to build in this society. And yet we're very poor bridge builders. We're actually brilliant here in Belfast at building walls. If ever a place was captive to its history, then this is it. And yet there is real change. The camera-toting tourists are a clear sign of that. But the walls remain, and there's not enough confidence to change that for now. Still, this was the only masked man we saw, and with luck and goodwill, when he grows up, perhaps all of this will be gone. Those walls are obviously uh something that we would like to see removed and I think as the political process goes from strength to strength uh, that the day will come but I think that decision has to be in the hands of the people who uh, live on both sides of the walls. Our job is to within the political process uh, continue to uh, make the gains that I know the vast majority of people uh, welcome, uh, build a better future that, that our people uh, want to see and build a, a situation where people feel comfortable uh, to remove those walls. In some areas, the fires of sectarianism will continue to burn, no matter what the politicians say. At this loyalist bonfire, Republican flags and posters are destroyed. 
More often than not, nights like this used to end in violence. Not now. Perhaps the best that can be hoped for in these places is peaceful coexistence. Around here, that's huge progress. Mm -hmm. 